ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد before we begin we like to extend our thanks and our gratitude to the qaimina for facilitating everything here and as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man lam yashkur an-nas lam yashkur allah he who does not thank the people has not thanked allah so we like to extend our thanks to the brothers and the sisters so inshallah ta'ala before i begin i like to give a shout out to all the youngers for coming up in this piece today because you know the home run steroid hitters are up in this piece today be in light ta'ala and we're going to drop the science inshallah ta'ala we find ya ikhwani ya akhwati much discussion has been going on between the muslims and as you know i like to keep my ear to the street and know what's going on today some of the brothers came to me and they said akhi don't you know that some of the kids at masjid abu huraira they had a beef and they're fighting yesterday some of the sisters in the masjid they had a beef and they were fighting yesterday we find ya ikhwan as the philosophers say that insanity what is insanity insanity is doing the same thing over and over again thinking that you're going to get a different result so we find ya ikhwan that illustrious sahaba Abu Hurairah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he quoted the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as saying and this hadith is collected in Imam Muslim where the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said la yuldaghu mu'min min juhrin wahidin marratayn wa kama qala sallallahu alayhi wasallam that the believer the one who is kayas and intelligent he doesn't get stung from the same hole twice and me and the brother having our phd in the streets Alhamdulillah we don't get stay we don't get stung from the same hole twice because we've learned the lesson so we find for the muslim brothers and the muslim sisters that that great sahabi ibn masud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he said that the fortunate one is the one who takes lessons from the fate of others and we see some of our brothers we love them for the sake of allah and we came here inshallah ta'ala for the sake of allah to try to encourage the youth that is time for us to start opening these more and closing this because some of you they say i know everything i know what's going on i know what's going on in the street say akhi you never seen the streets you never visited chicago you never visited detroit you never went to new york city you never went to brixton england you never went to trinidad you never went many places but yet you know the streets because you can go around the corner and hang out at the donut store and we heard some of our brothers got shot last night hanging out at the donut store we find ya ikhwan ya akhwat trying to look at this from the perspective of the quran and the sunnah has any of the ulama or the prophet sallallahu said anything about this turmoil that the ulama is going through right now we find that azubair ibn adi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he said dakhalna an anas bin malik radiyallahu ta'ala anhu fa shakawna ilayhi ma nalqa min al hajjaj ibn yusuf فقال اسفروا لا ياتي عليكم زمان الى بالذي بعده شر من حتى تلقوا ربكم سمعت هذا من نبيكم او صلى الله وكما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم we find that Zubair ibn Adi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he went on to say that we entered upon the illustrious companion Anas ibn Malik and he complained about al hajjaj and al hajjaj was a killer of the muslims and he claimed that he was a muslim so he said and he said have patience have patience a time will not come upon you except that which comes after it will be worse than it that a time will come that what comes after it will be worse than it so we find ya ikhwan that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had told us this that the times are going to get worse and worse and worse and we're discussing with the youth and we're discussing with brother ibrahim darni do you think that this is the beginning of all this fitna or this is the end of all this fitna we find ya ikhwan that what the religion tells us we have a beautiful hadith on the authority of abu sa'id al-khudri radiyallahu ta'ala anhu where he said that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man ra'a minkum munkaran falyughayyiruhu bi yadi fa in lam yastati' fa bi lisanihi fa in lam yastati' fa bi qalbihi wa dhalika al-ad'af al-iman wa akhrajahu sahih muslim an authority of abu sa'id al-khudri radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he said i heard the messenger of allah say whoever sees an evil 
then let him change it with his hand if he has the ability. And if he's not able to do that, then let him change it with his tongue. And if he's not able to do that, then let him hate it in the heart. So for all the fitna that's happening, at the very least level, all of us should hate it in our heart that Muslims are dying for no reason or and this is what we're trying to investigate, is there something more to the story? And I've talked to some of the boys from the block. What's going on in the block, Akhi? What's happening? What's, what's the real deal? Tell me what's up. Well, I heard this, and I heard that, and I heard this, and I heard that. We can't get a straight story on what's going on. But we have to say to the brothers and the sisters that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the authority of Abu Huraira once again, he went on to say, and this is the reality, Ya Ikhwani, Ya Akhwati. I want you to listen to this hadith because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has prophesied this more than 1400 years ago. Listen very attentively with your ears. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said on the authority of Abu Huraira, Inna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam qal, Walladhi nafsi biyadi. لِيَأْتِيَنَّا عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانِ لَا يَدْرِي الْقَاتِلُ فِي أَيِّ شَيْءٍ قَتَلَ وَلَا يَدْرِي مَقْتُوْ عَلَى أَيِّ شَيْءٍ قُتِلَ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم وأخرجه أصحي مسلم أبو هريرة he reported that the messenger of Allah صلى said by him in whose hand is my life a time will not come until that the murderer will not know why he has committed the murder and the victim will not know why he's been murdered. So if what the kids are saying, that the Muslims were innocent, they were sitting in their place, and somebody just came and started popping shots for no reason, we say, okay, let's be patient. Let's find out what's going on first. But the reality is, ya ikhwan, that the Prophet ﷺ had predicted that there'll be this situation. Also, another hadith, that we should be highlighting, ya ikhwan. The Messenger of said, in authority of Abu Huraira, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يكثر الحرج قالوا وما الحرج يا رسول الله قال القتل القتل أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم وأخرجه صحيح مسلم أبو هريرة reported that Allah's messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said that the last hour will not come unless there is much bloodshed. They said, what is this الحرج? Thereupon he said, bloodshed, bloodshed. So when we look at this يا إخوان Muslims killing Muslims, non-Muslims killing non-Muslims, Muslims and non-Muslims killing each other. For what? Because you have a beef, and many of the elders, they don't know what a beef is. So if I pull off his thing here, all of a sudden he has a beef with me, or I step on his shoe, I gotta get him, because you know what? I gotta be the boy on the block with the baddest rep. And some of the kids, like we said before, they're going on saying, I'm a gangster. And we said before, many of the kids, they don't even have a pencil to push somebody in the eye, but yet they're claiming that they're gangsters. <laughs> <laughs> I live on this block, Akhi. I'm repping this block, Akhi. My boys can do this, yeah, Akhi. I say, Akhi, you don't even have a pencil to push somebody in the eye. And that's the reality. Some of the kids, and we said to them here, some of the brothers, as for our sisters, we see them, mashallah, practicing Islam. We have the three six mafia, they came in here today with all their little thuggery gear. I'm repping Fila, and I'm repping this. I said, Where are the people of the Sunnah? And this is the thing, a Muslim hanging out at 2 o'clock in the night and other hours of the night after Salat al-Isha, not looking like the people of the Sunnah with the, with the armament of the people of the Sunnah, wearing the piety of the people of the Sunnah. When you dress and you act a certain way, people will respect you. But one thing, ya ikhwan, ya ikhwat, we're forgetting, that there is some creation that Allah Ta'ala, He created called al-mala'ika. If you're looking like Bubba from the street with the grill in their mouth, and some of the Muslims, I've seen them with my eye. Yahi, I got the new grill, man. <laughs> I'm so cool. I look like, uh, what's that guy's name? Mike Jones. I got the grill. Hanging out in the street. So now, if someone from the street came and they seen you and you're looking like this, don't you think they want to pop a shot in your head? But if you're looking like the people of the Sunnah, and as Imam al Ozai said, he said that we hang out with the sunnah wherever it is. So how is it that the, mo the young Muslim kid, he wants to look like Baba from the back street? This is something that we can't understand. Me and the brother, as you know, we accepted Islam and we came from Jahaliyyah. And we try our best, even though we're not angels, to do our best to practice Islam and to be seen as a Muslim. Some of the Muslims, from the brothers and the sisters, we ask them, don't you want to practice Islam? Don't you want to be upon the sunnah to say, it's boring. I'm bored. I'm bored coming to the masjid. I'd rather hang out in the club. 
I rather hang out in the block. And there was a sister that we were counseling, and this is for the sisters, I want you to pay attention. We had asked the sister, sister, why is it that you stop praying, and you stop wearing your hijab, and you stop being amongst the pious people? I'm bored, I'm looking for entertainment. I said, sister, you want excitement and hype? Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sister said, I'm bored. My reaction to her at that time, and some of us, David, you've heard this before. Ya Allah! How is it possible that you can be bored of the deen of Allah, and bored of Islam, and bored of the sunnah, and bored of fearing Allah wa ta'ala? How is it possible? The sister we sent shivers up her spine. Walillahi alham, the sister is now praying. She's now wearing hijab. So sometimes, you guys have to be shouted at. And some of the adults, oh no, we came to Canada. We can't hit the kids. Okay, you can't hit the kids. But you can shout at the kids. And you can yell at them and say, do you want to be a boy in the block? Or inside the penitentiary? Or you want to be hanging out with the people of the sunnah in the masjid? We find your ikhwan in the last hadith I had today before I hand it over to my beloved brother, my elder, my mentor, one of my good friends. We find that the Prophet said, went on to say, an Abi Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam satakunu fitunun qa'idu fiha khairun min al-qa'im wa qa'imu khairun min al-mashi wa mashi fiha khairun as-sa'i man tashrafu man tashrafu laha tashrifuhu wa man wajida maljan aw mu'adhan fal yu'bihi wa kama qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ruahu Bukhari we find that the Messenger of Allah said on the authority of Abu Huraira that there will be fitna, trials and afflictions during which time a sitting person will be better than a standing person and a standing one will be better than a walking one and a walking one will be better than a running one and whoever will expose himself to the fitna, the trials and afflictions they will destroy him so whoever can find a place of protection and refuge from them should take shelter in. So instead of being a boy on the block, bopping your head to 50 Cent and whatever other gangster rappers that are out there, why are you not hanging out in the masjid with Mu'alam Samu or some of the other brothers learning that book of Allah? <laughs> some of the Muslims, they told me, Akhi, I love the book of Allah. I love Islam. See, Akhi, but you love 50 Cent more. He's on the back of your wall, on the back of your door. And even some of the sisters we've heard, what I stuck for Allah Ladim, they have a picture of 50 Cent and unfortunately he's showing the six pack or the five pack or the eight pack or whatever kind of pack he has. Brothers and sisters, we are Muslims. If we don't act like Muslims, we're in big trouble with that. Hada ma indi wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajmain wa subhanaka lahumma wa bihamdika wa ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta wa na astaghfiruka wa na tubi ilayk. I'd like to introduce for those who don't know, my brother Akhana Abu Musa. Our brother here, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, is very active in the community and for close to 20 years he's been working with the Muslim youth and working with the Muslims that enter into the jail. And the jail, the people there are happy to say, come, come Muslims, come into the jail. We want you to spend time so we can get the tax dollars and employ all our people. And the Muslims are foolish enough to go into the jail. And with that we leave it to our brother. Wa kulu khair. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu Billahi Min Ash-Shaitan Ar-Rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the Worlds Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim He is the most gracious, most merciful Maliki Yawm Adin He is the owner of the Day of Judgment Iyaka Na'abadu wa Iyaka Nasta'een It is Thee alone we worship You alone we ask for help Ihdina Sarat Al-Mustaqeem Guide us to the straight way Sarat Al-Ilina Anam Ta'alayhim the way of those who you are favored. Qayril Madubi alayhim, waladhalin. Not the way of those who have earned your anger, nor of those who go astray. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow this gathering to be blessed with His guidance. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He will protect us against the fitna and the evil of the people of this society and what they do. We are here. I am here. Myself and my good brother, Abu Shahara. We come here today to share some information with you. Now you may not like some of the stuff I'm going to say. I can pretty well guarantee that that's not going to be easy. But I want to start by asking you a question. How many people here have been to a janazah? 
How many? And I'm not just talking about the people who die from your family, from the young people who die from us. Anybody been here? Come on, brothers. You guys in Benjamin? We need to get you over there then. Because this is a certain reality that nobody can deny. We're going to come to this situation, and what's happening now is the young people, they're moving in a direction that's coming now to, to increase the possibility of that happening. How many people would like to go to a janazah? Because we're going to go to one soon, isn't it? We're going to have, we had one last week, didn't you have one last week? How many people went to that janazah that was in the masjid? How many people? Put up your hands. Speak up now, put up your hands high, let's see. How many people? Hundreds of people went to that janazah. We heard thousands of people went to that janazah. How many more janazahs is it going to take before we're going to get it straight? Now, I came here today to speak about something very particular. The thing I want to speak to you about is a thing called vertical violence. And what is vertical violence? This is the violence of black on black. This is the violence of Muslim on Muslim. This is the violence of family member on family member, on friend on friend. This is the situation that we're facing right now. So we're living in a time and we're facing a situation where the difficulty is coming to us from multiple directions. It's not only one direction. Multiple directions are coming at us. And we are not preparing ourselves to deal with that. So, I want to talk about three things today. My topic is going to be very clear cut. I'm going to talk about three things and I'm going to focus on these three, three things specifically. Number one, horizontal violence. What is that? That's the violence that goes across where we're just harming each other and we're damaging each other and we are coming out to perpetrate some of the worst crimes against each other. The blacks on the blacks. You have a person who looks like you. He has a mother that looks like you, he has a father that looks like you. Maybe he comes from a culture similar to yours. And guess what? You're ready to go ahead and snuff him out. You have a sister that looks like you, and you are ready to go and perpetrate against her the worst wicked crime, and you'd even take her life just because of some small beef. Little problem turned into a big issue. We want to talk about also what's called the vertical violence. Anybody know what vertical violence is? If you don't, you'll find out very quickly if you practice this. If you practice horizontal violence, you're going to get vertical violence. What is it? This is where the state comes down on you. This is where they send the police, the Metro Police, the RCMP, the OPP. They're going to send the people after you. Because many of the people in the authority, they already believe that we're coming out to be terrorists. Yeah, that's right, I did say the T word. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the young people, you, brothers, these young people, you, sisters, they already believe that you're homegrown terrorists. You were born here, and that you have no other objective except to be a terrorist. So they're waiting for you to perpetrate this, so they can come and give you this. Does that make sense? You, you understand what I'm talking about? Okay, well, then the third reality that you need to know is that if we continue to do this, we're going to get this, and ultimately we end up with this. What's that? Social suicide. Where we are racking up numbers in such high levels in the jail system that's unbelievable, unprecedented. Even the Kafirs are looking at it and saying, how can they do this? The Muslims are the largest growing group of people in the jail system, in the drug rehabilitation, and in the shelters. We are harming each other to the degree that we're coming out to, to blow records. You know when somebody sets a record, it's a big deal, right? We are making records of harming each other and bringing violence to each other and bringing this condition of being insensitive to the situation of one Muslim to another. Amazing situation. Let's take a look at some issues. Now, as the brother said, the Zafila Karim, we've been in this work for about 20 years. Maybe more than that, really. Because for me, it seems like a lifetime pursuit. But the thing is, how do we get here? Let me show you something. In 1987, the percentage of Muslims in jail, and we can relate that directly to the percentage of Muslims committing violence against each other, at least recorded violence, is coming out to be 1% or less. Everybody with me so far? It's 1987. There's no jail program. There's no jail program in 1987. The Muslims are not there. Nobody's doing anything this time. Right? Then you have 3% in 1992. That's when we started. 1992, we started a program. So think about this. By 2002, right now, I'm sorry, 1997, what do we have? We have over here, we have 5%. Are 
Our program has been involved for five years. Myself and Abu Shahada, we're going back and forth to the jails. We're crossing the country. We're crossing the province. We're crossing the city to go to hundreds of Muslims every single month to be able to give them some encouragement, to be able to help them get through the process of incarceration. And when he starts talking about the people of the Sunnah, do you know there's a certain reality in the jail? And I want to give you a story. I'm going to break off here and give you a brief story. You know, we had one of our brothers. He went to jail recently, about two weeks ago. And the thing was, he's been doing some very bad things. He's been involved with drugs. And then he behind the drugs now, he came to do some really horrible things and became very violent with some of his family members. Not the Kafirs, not the people of the community, not some strangers, not somebody else, his family. And because of that now, he had to go to jail. There was no other choice in the matter. His family doesn't want him to be there. But he's there, they can't bring him out because he's a danger to them and he's a danger to others. And this brother, he went to court and he wanted his family to take him out. His family said, no, we can't take you out. We love you, we're there for you, we want to protect you, we want to help you, but we can't take you out, you're too dangerous. So if you want, we're going to send brother Ibrahim to you, and if you work with him, you're going to find a better condition. If you're not willing to work with him, we don't have any answer for you, you have to come out by yourself. So the brother, not getting the bail, he went back to the jail. When he goes back to the jail, what does he say to the officer? He said to the officer, oh, you stupid so-and-so, you effing this and that. He's cursing him out, calling his mother names. What did the officer do? Beat him up. He beat him up. And the guy's in the, now, he's in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement. Isolated from every single other person. Being horribly treated. Because of what? Not using his intelligence. Because of what? Going now to come now to perpetrate crimes against people. For doing what? For coming now to use drugs. So the situation for him is horrible and it's getting worse. The fact of the matter is, when a person goes to jail, if they're practicing their Islam, guess what happened? Most of the people, they leave them alone. It's a fact. I'm telling you, we've been there for 20 years, and I'm telling you, when the people practice their Islam, and the brothers sincerely come to bring the deen, I'm telling you, the people leave you alone. They don't know what to do with you. They don't even know how to, how to even talk with you. Now they want to know who you are as a Muslim. How you can come now to represent when you got all this pressure on you, when you got all this difficulty on you, when the media is coming now to point their finger at you and put you in the worst condition and claim that you're one of the worst people and you don't deserve any consideration in our society. They wondering how can you practice this? How can you hold on to this deen when it's like a hot coal? How can you do it? And you know what the next thing is? They put up their hands and say, I want to be a Muslim too. Also in the jails, Islam is the fastest growing religion, not Christianity. Not Hinduism, not Judaism, Islam. Why? Because the Muslims are coming now to show a level of practice that when the people see it and the people understand it, they embrace it, they love it. And some of them are more sincere than some of you, and maybe even me. We have some things to talk about. In 2002, after September 11, we went 50%. 50%. We have more Muslims in the jail at that time. It was overwhelming. Now we're coming now to be almost 15%. 15%. So think about this. There's a jail right down the street, the West Detention Center. It presently has between 65 and 80 inmates of 600 population. There's about 600 people in the jail, and about 80 of those people are Muslim. You understand what I'm saying? That's a lot of people. That's a lot of our people. That's a lot of work. So, we have to do something to change that balance. I have to bring you some information that I hope will inspire you. I can't tell you what to do. Abu Shahada can't tell you what to do. The Master can't tell you what to do. The brothers here, we love you. They put on these conferences so they can get to you, they can appeal to you, so they can educate you. But it's up to you to make the move. It's not on us. But we tell you, turn to Allah. It is you alone we worship. It is you alone we ask for help. We're supposed to be saying this 17 times a day. Supposed to be. But we should also be saying with knowledge, sincerity, and understanding. Let us move forward. Horizontal violence, what is it? Well, it's black on black crime, Muslim on Muslim crime, family to family crime, friend to friend crime. And it goes beyond that as well. So, we have seen in the last few weeks, not even the last few weeks, last couple days, we have heard so many stories of the Muslims fighting each other. I mean, we're finding reasons to fight each other. We get a small issue and we make it a big problem. 
We get a big problem, we don't even want to see it as a small issue. Now we want to make it gigantic so that everybody got to get involved. So what's going to happen now? We're going to start becoming the own victims of violence. We're going to be the victims. We're going to be the ones victimizing each other to the point where it's going to become crazy. So what are the forms does it take? The forms of violence are physical assaults, assaults with guns. This is very common these days. Why is it common? Because people don't want to lose. If they feel disrespected, what they want to do now is they're going to come to retaliate. We've heard some of the brothers talking already. And we never heard the sisters because we didn't talk to them yet. But the sisters may have the same idea. Somebody assaulted you. Somebody put you down. Somebody came now to address you in a disrespectful manner. What you going to do? You're going to go ahead. You're going to assault them. You're going to pull out a gun and knife. You're going to punch them in the face. What are you going to do? You're going to bring some physical assault to them. And sometimes it's even your mother or your father. That's becoming common in our community too. Another story. We have a young brother up in Thorn Hill. He comes now to want to disrespect. Now think about this. This brother is going to school and when he's going to become a Hafiz of Quran. He's in school. He comes now to have a dis... Uh, um, uh, they have a disagreement with his father and his mother. So the father comes now to tell him, no, you can't do this. He insists on going ahead and doing it. Guess what happened? He comes down to grab his father and tell him, I'm going to do what I want to do. The father pushes him down. He comes back and pushes the father. And then the, the son, he goes and picks up the phone and calls 911. Anybody know those numbers? Yeah, yeah, you know those numbers. You know what I'm talking about. 911. He calls 911 and what happens now? The police come. When the police come, the son says to the police, Oh, my dad assaulted me. He's not talking about his wrong. He's not taking responsibility for any of his actions. So now what he does, he comes now to get grabbed, and he grabs his father, and he puts his father in the situation, makes his father a victim of violence. The police take his father to jail. In the meantime, while they're taking him out the house, the mother freaks out. Why are you taking my husband? My son is the one who did the problem. My husband didn't do anything. He's showing respect. He's trying to get this young man to show respect. No, he doesn't want that. So what did they do? The wife tried to resist with the police. They took her brother too. There's two kids in the house. The boy, he's 16, and the next brother who's 12. Guess what happened to the kids? Anybody? Sorry? They went in right into where? Children's aid. You know what I'm talking about. You know what the deal is. So what's happening here? So we have a mother and a father who got to come out of jail now. They got to get lawyers, they got to get bail, they got to go through the whole process of the humiliation of being stripped down. Stripped down naked and being made to stand against the wall and do things nobody would even want to do. None of you would want to even talk about that. But now we have our adults, Muslims, being exposed to this condition. The kids, they want to the children's aid. The parents got to go now and hire a lawyer to get the kids back. We're not talking about this. It doesn't show up in the newspaper. It's not being discussed. It's not something that's out there. You don't hear it on CNN or CNBC or CFTO. Nobody's talking about it. But it's happening more and more, where the violence is being perpetrated right in our homes. We don't have to go to the street all the time. That's just one of the places you'll find it. There's others. You can come to the school. You can get it when you go to the masjid. You hear what the brother said? You can get it when you go to the masjid. They had two fights in two days in the masjids. In the masjid. We know brothers who are bringing weapons to the masjid. Now I'm going to advise all of you, don't do that. Both the sisters and the brothers, don't do that. Don't bring your weapons to the masjid. Matter of fact, don't bring your problems to the masjid. The masjid is designed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the masjid, He's given us the issue of sakina, the circumstance of tranquility, to be at peace with yourself, to be at peace with your sisters, to be at peace with your brothers. So don't bring your violence, don't bring your anger, don't bring your problem to the masjid. Come to the masjid to find a solution. Why do we say like that? You see, before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there was a time. Does anybody know what the time before he was called? Jahiliyyah. It was called Jahiliyyah. Why was it called Jahiliyyah? Because the reality was, the people were looking to other than the guidance of God for to form their solutions. They didn't form the solutions based on the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this term. He gave it the term Jahiliyyah, the time of ignorance. So we as a people are moving in that direction. Where we're coming now to act more ignorant. And we're not coming to the circumstance of looking at how Islam can help us solve our problems. This is our biggest mistake. There's no bigger mistake than that. Talk to the ulema. Talk to the shayuk. They have answers. 
We want to talk to the people today. We're talking already. We're talking to some of the leaders. We need to open up a counseling center. How many people agree we need to have a counseling or community center? Anybody agree with that? Brothers, you don't agree with that? Well, you can't raise your hand? Put down that chicken bowl, man. Anyway. <laughs> come on, we need to have a community center. We need a place where you and other people can come to be able to talk about their issues so we can guide you according to what's right and correct in Islam. Anybody agree with that? Just as an indication, if you agree with that as a principle, just raise your hand. That's just about everybody, isn't it? You see, we have to have something. But at the same time, you have to take responsibility. So let's move forward. How did the horizontal violence get to be such an academic? Well, we have a number of reasons I've listed here, and you can add to the list. One is ignorance. We become ignorant, and because we become ignorant now, as soon as you say you know something, guess what? You shut off your mind, and therefore you invoke ignorance. Because the circumstance of knowing something is very broad, and it can be on different levels that you can know. You don't know everything. And therefore, you have to understand. I go to the same guy in the jail, and we're giving him, we, give him, uh, we give him work to do. When you're going through our program, we do counseling in the jail, and it's not free. I know some people are talking like that. We do, we do dawah, which is free. We do counseling, you pay for that. You pay for that. And we're giving this guy work, and we're telling this guy straightforward, right? The first thing you need to do is you need to know Al-Fatiha. How many people know Al-Fatiha? Could you raise your hand? If I don't see everybody's hand up, man, somebody's lying. Okay? Now you ain't supposed to be in here lying. You know you know Al-Fatiha. Okay? But how many people, now raise your hand again. How many people know what it means in English? Could you raise your hand? Oh, look at the sisters. Oh, only a couple of brothers. Oh, brother, we got some work to do, man. Okay? The sisters got all of their hands. Oh, you see that? Anyway, here's the point. How can you apply what you don't know? You can recite it, but you don't know what it means? No. This guy, he went far off track. I give him the analogy. If I told him, I said, if I was going to build a house, and I was building that house on sand, would you say it's a good idea or a bad idea? Bad idea or good idea? Bad. It's a bad idea. Why? Because the sand, it can't hold it. It can't stabilize. It doesn't have any ability to be firm. It moves with the situation in the environment around it. If the rain comes too much, it can be going now to be affected. It comes now to the snow, if it comes now to the wind, whatever happens, it can be affected. But what happens now is, if I say to you, I want to build my house on rock, would you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? It's a good idea. Why? Because the rock has some firmness, some stability. You get a good foundation. The foundation that we're coming to when we start talking about the vertical, the horizontal violence, is coming now to set our foundations on the sand. Because it's a dead end street. And it ends usually at the graveyard where we're making janazah. And we're going to the graveyard to bury the people who were heavily involved in it. Or the people who happen to be involved in it even by accident. Which happens on occasion. So it's a dead end street. So ignorance is one of the main issues we want to cover. We also want to talk about, yeah, we also want to talk about uh, low self-esteem. You know, Abu Shahada, he made some very good points. He says, for, for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May, may Allah bless you. He made some very good points. Is that we have to represent ourselves as Muslims. And we're not just talking about the sisters wearing hijab. We're talking about the brothers. We're talking about the brothers coming out to be people who are coming out to identify as who they are because much of the violence is perpetrated on them and with them. But if you're identifying yourself as a Muslim and you're connecting yourself to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance is, guess what happened? You start to feel a little bit more conscious when you're wearing that kufi, when you have on that thaw, when you're coming now to, circum to, to have that condition of reflecting on what Allah is telling you, you're going to have a better condition. Is that right? At least you can try. At least it's an indication that you're moving in that direction. But if you're not coming out to have high self-esteem, you look at Islam like it doesn't work. Well, Islam works fine, but you got to work it. It's a plan. But it's a plan that you have to work. The plan works if you work the plan. Let's talk about the issue of jealousy. Some people are so jealous of each other, they'll just stab you, shoot you, they don't care. They just don't care. It's over. Then there's other people who are going to come now with envy. You know what envy is? They call it the green-eyed monster. They just want what you got. And they don't care about taking it from you. They'll take it by force. They also have to deal with the issue of turf wars. Now, I don't get this. Personally, I don't get this. I didn't get this before and I don't get it now. Right? But I lived through a time where we used to have this situation of turf wars. I grew up in Jane and Finch. Anybody know that area? Yeah, and, and when we were living up there, it's a crazy thing because we lived up there back in 1968 when they built it. 
They just built it. And we used to have fights with who? The Italians. We, we used to have major fights with the Italians. And we were fighting over turf. Now, the fortunate thing is, nobody got killed, but we used to get some real vicious, violent things going on over there. So, here's the thing. I didn't understand it then. I was just plugging into the system because that was the general idea that was going through the community. It was wrong then, it's wrong now. The only turf that you can claim is the turf that you're going to be buried in. I want you to keep that in mind, both the brothers and the sisters. The only turf that you're going to claim for any period of time is the turf you're going to be buried in. The rest of it, you're walking, you're moving all the time, even if you're living there, you don't own it. Even the one in the grave, you don't own it, but Allah's going to leave you there until the day of judgment, guaranteed. That's a guarantee from Allah. You'll be there until the day of judgment, then you'll come out from there and you'll come to your judgment as to what you did with your circumstance of life. So we have a very short time. Some of us are shorter than others. To be able to get it right, to be able to do what it takes to turn this situation around in our favor. You know, in my opinion, as Muslims, and it doesn't matter what you did before, it matters what you do from this day forward. We should be the people who are coming now to establish what the sincerity level for worship of Allah is on this earth. Anybody agree with that? We, not anybody else, we as Muslims, we're the ones who are supposed to be coming now to show the people the sincerity level of what a human being could do to worship their Creator. Anybody with me on that? Alright. But this thing's going to get in the way. One of the things that gets in the way is turf wars. Another thing comes to be drugs. You know, we're trying to talk to people and show them about the drug issue. It's a major issue. I mean, it's overwhelming. How much this thing is just, it's consuming our families. It's destroying so many people. I personally lost two brothers to drug overdoses. Two, ten weeks apart. We know what we're talking about. It's killing us. And the drugs, the drugs that doesn't care who it kills. It's indiscriminate. It will take you down. It will take your family down. It will make you and all the people around you victims, even of violence. So we have to straighten some things out. We also want to know about power. Anybody want the power? I got the power! Huh? Yeah, yeah. No, those guys out here, they're flexing. They want to flex. I can flex. I can flex. You know that I can flex. Okay, some of the brothers out there, I can flex too, brother. You know, the sister out there, no, we got to flex. <laughs> but hey, it's not about power. The power that you have, the most important you have, the most important power that you're ever going to exhibit, that you're ever going to establish, is your power to do and fulfill the thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you for, and that is His worship. I got it. Okay, what can we do about it? Anybody? Anybody got any quick suggestions about what we should do about this issue of this horizontal violence? Can we control it? Anybody agree we can control it? Sure we can. What do we, what's the first thing? Now for me, everybody, and I mean everybody who goes through our training, everybody, it comes down to this. It comes down to these two points. You're either going to live above the line or below the line. Everybody got that? Everybody with me so far? Now some of you have seen this before. For those of you who have it, you need to remember this. Because it's probably the most important thing that we can share with you. And what is it? Below the line, what did the people do? They blame. Who did they blame? They blame anyone. They blame everyone. It doesn't matter. They continue to blame and they continue to do this. Now, my question is this. When the people are blaming, does this continue, does this make them weak or does it make them strong? Everybody agree? It makes you weak. Yes? Okay. Let's get back to that in a second. When you come down to the point of living above the line, what do you got to do? You got to do what? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You want to do what? Uh-huh. Now, I'm asking each one of you, each one of you, especially you gangbangers, okay? You guerrilla warfare people, okay? You musket disruptors, okay? We got transformers, we got musket disruptors, okay? Listen. We need, to, we need to transform some stuff and move in another direction. But I need each one of you right here, right now, to make a determination for yourself. Do you want to be above the line, or do you prefer to be below the line? Above the line. Everybody who wants to be above the line, please raise your hand. I got both hands up. Why? Because it's the only place to be. It's the only place where we're going to come now to actually resolve these issues and put some of this stuff behind us. Okay? So let's take a look at something. Why is it that we come now to blame? 
You see, when you're blaming, what happens? You got one finger pointing out. I could blame all of you. It's all of your fault. It's your fault. I'm not blaming anyone, just so you know, right? It's on camera, I'm not saying anybody's fault. I don't believe in this whole blame thing. I take responsibility. I did something, I take responsibility for me. But I don't want to take responsibility for you unless you want to do good. If you want to do good, I'll be responsible with you. But I'm not going to be responsible for you. Does that make sense? Right. So when I'm pointing my finger out like this and I'm saying it's your fault, it's only an indication of what the responsibility level is. But guess what? I have one finger pointing out here showing you that I think you're responsible. But guess what? I got three fingers pointing back at me showing that I am responsible. I'm making the decisions. I'm making the decisions that are causing me to interact with you and those things can be good or it can be bad. You see, the problem is, and we all agree, that if you continue to blame what happens is, it makes you weak. And it makes you so weak that you get to the point where you can't help yourself and you can't help anyone else. There's a word for that, there's a term. The term is lame. The blame game becomes a lame game. You won't help yourself, you won't help anyone else. You are now disqualified for the circumstance of leadership. Both for yourself, for your family, for our community, for the society, period. You don't qualify. Now, on the other hand, you can live above the line as everyone indicated they want to do and you can learn. And if you decide to do that, what do you do? Sorry? Nobody wants to do what? Oh uh, yeah, you want to earn. Why not? Well, see, this is, this is two separate things. And they're not equal. So you have to make a determination, a decision for yourself now. See, at some point in time, let's talk about how things get jammed up. You know, we have instincts. And on the lower level in our brain, this is what's happening. Our instincts are kicking in. And when somebody comes to us, what is the strongest human instinct? Anybody know? Survival. Survival. Everybody wants to survive. No exceptions. Everybody wants to survive. Unless you get into a situation where you're coming now to be like the Sahaba, where they would give up their lives for their brother. We're not like that today. We take each other's lives. We're not giving up each other. We're not giving up a life for another one. No, 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 no. We don't see that. We see that in some places, not here. But we see it. It can happen. But the instinct of survival is crucial. Everybody's got it. It's a natural thing. Allah made it natural for everyone. But hear this, right? We have to come to the issue of reason. And this is supposed to be the thing that allows us to control the circumstance of instinct. Because if the instinct gets out of control, guess what happens? Terrible things happen. The vertical violence goes right across, it ripples right across our families, our masjids, our schools. If we're not using our reason, because it's our reason that's supposed to tell us that this is not the right place, this is not the right time, this is not the right way for us to behave. But even if the reason fails, if the instinct gets out of line, and the reason fails, even if all of that happens, we still got one last shot. We still got one thing that's not supposed to fail. It has been designed not to fail. It has been designed to redeem the people. It has been designed to reclaim the circumstance of guidance that anybody wants to plug into it at any point in time. No matter what you did before, you can come back to your circumstance, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and jump into your spirit. But you got to be ready to plug in and do what it takes. And that means pray five times a day. That means clean yourself. That means make some ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we come to a point where we cannot be purified. I'm coming out of Tim Hortons the other day, and I'm seeing a bunch of brothers. This is like maybe 12.30 in the night. I'm coming off of work. And a bunch of Muslim kids are standing out there, and they're talking. Well, they shouldn't say they're talking, they're swearing. And I can't even say the words, you know what I'm talking about. You heard the words before, I don't need to reiterate all of that. They're cursing and carrying on like this, and I'm just walking by. I had to stop and tell the brother, say, brothers, do you know what happens? I said, you know what, when you come to the point where you're, you're swearing, what happens is this. Hold on one second. Yeah, you see, you have a heart. And when you come now, when you come now to actually perpetrate this particular thing of swearing, what happens is these little black marks start to appear. It's like rust. Okay? But it also happens when you perpetrate horizontal violence. When you come now to harm another person. When you're coming now to do the wicked and corruption. When you're coming now to disrespect your parents. When you're coming now to disrespect your teachers. When you're coming now to do harm in the masjid. When you're coming now to go to the school and be a bully. When you're coming now to do all the things that you know you're not supposed to be doing. And causing all kinds of confusion out there. This is what your heart looks like afterward. Everybody with me so far? You understand my point? 
Alright, so how do you clean that heart? Is it possible or the heart has to stay like that? Is it possible to clean it? How do you clean it? You do what? You have to worship Allah. You have to make some zikr. You have to do something that reconnects you with the cleaning process. The cleaning process is ibadah. The cleaning process is, uh, is zikr. The cleaning process is to remember Allah. When you forget Allah, Allah make you forget yourself. And guess what? You come now to destroy yourself with your own hand. But the problem is now, you're not only destroying yourself, you're destroying others. Okay, they're telling me I gotta wrap this up. So I gotta move forward. Okay, here's the things we need to do. I don't believe in talking about the situation without offering some solution. <clears throat> what do you think about this? We have to stop being victims of violence. We have to stop being victims of violence. We can't ask anybody else to do that for us. You know, there was a very good analogy in something my brother shared with me, Jazakallah Karim. He shared with me an analogy about the crabs, crab on crab violence. You heard that mentioned? Crab on crab violence, what is that? Do you ever hear the story of the crabs in a barrel? You hear that analogy? There's a bunch of crabs in a barrel, and the crab, one crab is trying to get up to the edge to be able to crawl out. And what do the other crabs do? They pull them back. People are always saying this analogy. So, we got a couple questions. Who created that environment? Right now, the people in this society are treating us, Muslims, they're treating us like we are crabs in a barrel. And guess what? The Muslims, because we're acting like crabs in a barrel, we're also, when the brother trying to pull out, we just pull him down. Sister trying to get out, mm-mm, you ain't going that way. So, some of the people say, well, you know, if, if you're getting out, why is the crab grabbing the other crab and pulling them down? They say, well look, if you're trying to get out, I want to get out too. So either, we're going to get out together, we're going to die in here. So we're dying enough, isn't it? But how come we're not helping each other? How come we're not changing the circumstance of our environment? Well, I think that there's three things that, that cause that situation to happen. Number one is we don't have enough, actually there's four. Number one is we don't have enough personal empowerment. We're, our self-esteem has been hurt by the wars, by the trauma, by the vicious behavior, by all the accusations, and so on and so forth. So, number one is our emotional condition, it's damaged. We need something to, to improve it. Number two is we don't have the financial empowerment. We have increasing poverty in the Muslim community. With our families, increasing poverty. Horrible situation. And we think we're doing okay, but guess what? Everybody else is moving ahead of us, and we're the only ones not helping each other. We hardly shop with each other. We hardly move in a direction to build with each other. So guess what? We're not going to get there. Right? Then there's the circumstance of coming now to not have the educational empowerment. We don't have it. But because we don't have educational empowerment, we don't have political empowerment. And because we don't have political empowerment, we're just going with whatever the flow is. The other day, they elected one of the guys to be the leader of the liberals in one of the areas, and he is a known homosexual. And the Muslims voted for him. No, admit it. I'm not saying anything bad about him. He talks about his own situation, but that's the deal. You see, so we have a situation where we're not even offering anybody to go up there and say, okay, go up there and represent us. We're not even in the deal. We don't got any part of the deal. So we got problems. So we need to talk about the crab on crab violence at a much later date because we don't have time now. But we also need to talk about increase in poverty. We need to have some circumstance of empowerment financially. We need to figure out how we can do it. Now I have some ideas already and if anybody wants to know my ideas, you're welcome to come and speak to me. Because I will tell you what I'm doing in terms of trying to turn this thing around and trying to put some things straight. But you, maybe, not, maybe it's not for you, I don't know. But at least I will tell you about that. On top of that now, we have to decrease. We have to decrease our ignorance. We're living in a society where, you know, when we go, they had a thing recently where they were giving out free passes at the library. Free passes to go to the science center, to go to the museum, to go to places like this, educational places. Did anyone here in this room get one of those free passes? Anyone? Kids, a couple kids over here, anybody else? Sisters? No, that doesn't look like very many people, right? So what happened? The Chinese, they showed up. The Jews, they were first in line. <laughs> so where, where, how, how is it? Everybody wants to go for the information that can empower them. And they know that if you know your history, even if it's someone else's history, you can be empowered by that. But we don't even get the history. So we're walking around thinking we got it going on with our cultures. And our cultures are being slammed, devastated. And it's not getting anywhere. But it's good to have it. 
If you feel comfortable with that, wonderful. But we have to decrease our in ignorance. And we also have to be very careful of the issue of the vertical violence. Because the vertical violence, they're lining up for us. You know, some people start talking about they want to go now and they want to deal with all this stuff and all this violence. I say, listen, you're not ready for these people. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. You see, in the jail, the people are prepared for you. In the streets, the people are prepared for you. Do you know that? These people have taken training over and over and over. They spend millions, if not billions of dollars being prepared to deal with us in any situation we can have. We're not prepared for them. We don't spend any time dealing with that. And we shouldn't have to. Those people are there technically, technically to protect us and to protect our interests. But we don't stand up for our interests. Even we had one brother yesterday, he told me he's in the military and they're fussing with him about wearing a beard. But the Sikh is allowed to wear a turban and wear a beard and they don't say nothing to him. Because the Sikh community backs him up. The Muslims are not backing this guy up. This guy's in a physical, legal court battle. To do what? To wear his beard and represent himself as a Muslim. SubhanAllah. The sisters are how much, how much trouble they're getting in and how much difficulty they get in to wear hijab. I'm working at one place and it's amazing because many of the sisters there, they don't wear no hijab. And they're walking around with the tight tights and all this kind of stuff. And we're trying to talk with them, we're trying to encourage them, you know, sister, please. You know, but still, the people are not coming to realize the value of Islam. And we're going to have to have a talk about that at one point. I'm just about finished my presentation, so just give me one minute, brother. Okay. Let me tell you, I just have a couple suggestions. I want to finish with this. Um, number one, education is our passport to the future. For tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare for it today. Are we prepared for the future? I'm just asking you your opinion. Are we prepared for the future given our present circumstance? No. I'm sorry? No. Sorry? No. Oh. Brothers, what do you think? <laughs> the brothers are like, oh man, you guys are just sitting there, man. I, 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 this is almost over, man. Is this too painful for you? All right. Don't worry about it. Right? All right. If we could not, si we, we could not silence the voices that we don't like to hear. Now there's a whole bunch of people who are coming out here and they want to do this thing with rap. And then they want to have other media influences. And they want to have hop, hoop, hoop dreams. Where you're coming out, you want to be a basketball star. You want to be like Michael Jordan. Well, we're going to have to talk about that because that's not really going anywhere. We have children making foolish choices when they have nothing to lose. And this is why the vertical violence and the horizontal violence is coming on us. Because the people are coming now to have nothing to lose. Why, why, why should they stop? They can do anything they want. What's going to be the problem? You see? So, a person who stands for nothing will fall for anything. That means drugs, alcohol, sexual issues. He stands for nothing. He can just fall out. Right? Okay? Force against force equals more force. And we're talking about violence and gangs. We have some brothers who are coming now to talk about retaliation. So horrible things have happened. Well, you're not organized yourself. You're not in a situation to be able to empower yourself for that situation. And we tell you, you should step down from that and try to find another way. There's got to be another way to resolve it. Violence is going to be more violence and it's going to continue to per perpetuate to, to God's end. And no, is, there's a dead end. It's not going anywhere. And lastly, we want to talk about, uh, if you're on the road to nowhere, take a different road. We're going down a road that's not taking us anywhere close to the goals and the objectives that we want to have. So how are we going to get to where we want to go if we're going down a road that goes nowhere? And last thing I want to share with you here today, uh, the one who asks questions does not lose his or her way. We need more counseling. I believe we need more counseling. You know, one of the things that uh, we found is absolutely uh, 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 clear is that in the jail system, we're not reaching enough people. Do you understand what I'm saying? We go to the drugs. I'm a drug rehab counselor. I've just completed my counseling for, for to be a qualified drug rehabilitation counselor. Anybody else know anybody who's in this capacity? We don't know anybody and I'm the only one who took the course. <laughs> it's crazy. But anyway, here's this, right? So we come in now to be in a situation where, you know, we, we have to come now to grasp what it is we need to do. Okay, so when, when we're coming now to, to miss these points, we're now missing the opportunity to go ahead and take control. And if we don't take control, somebody else is telling us what to do and controlling us, as they do in the jails, as they do in the drug rehab, as they do in the shelters. I just want to say, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity to be here with you today. I'm hoping the information I provided you is not overwhelming. I hope that it would be something that you would absorb, that you would consider, and that you really reflect on. 
But most of all, I hope that you will take some time to consider the points and try to find some way to act on them. Because really, if we don't change our situation, it's not going to change. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not change the condition of a people until they change within themselves. Wa kulli kulli hadha, astaghfirullah wa alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.